Welcome to the introductory lecture of the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Mikowski and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. In the first part of the course, we will learn an analytic method called textual theory, which we will then use to analyze literature from the Middle East. We will follow an introductory book describing this theory, which is called Textual Theory and Introduction, written by Joanna Govins. And we will use this approach to analyze short stories from the book called Gaza Writes Back, which is an anthology of short stories compiled by Rifat al-Arir. You can find links to the books in the description below. In the second part of the course, we will focus more on identity issues which are particular to Palestinian society. As this is an introductory lesson, I will speak more broadly uh, about literature. I will introduce a cognitive explanation of literature. How do we explain the cognition, the human cognitive activity behind literature? I will talk about perceiving reality as a story, which is a learned skill and how this skill is connected, how it developed into what we call today literature. This lecture will therefore be more uh, theoretical and even uh, philosophical in nature. It will lay the theoretical basis for the rest of the course. But the following lessons will not be so philosophical. As I said, the following meetings uh, will be devoted to learning the textual theory, and to analyze uh, short stories from Gaza Writes Back. And the second part of the course, we will, uh, we will talk about Palestinian uh, society and the identity issues there. But now uh, let's go to the storied mind. And at the end of this lecture, I will tell you what your assignment for this week is. <laughs> Literature is cultural. It's a cultural artifact, cultural thing. And by culture, I don't mean to say that this is high culture, as opposed to, let's say, uh, popular culture. Albeit this could be the case, but uh, these categories of high and low culture are not always relevant nowadays in academic thinking. It is culture because it is something that is learned from the social environment. It is not biological. And it is something that is performed intentionally by people. We don't just happen to write literature. When saying that literature is a cultural artifact, not a biological one, not a natural one, if you want to use this complicated word, I'm not saying that literature is an invention out of the blue. Because cultural things in general are based on things that are they're already in the environment, but they are now performed or created in an intentional way by imitating what already exists, imitating something that is natural. Imitating seems to be a, an intuitive biological process, and it is a way for youngsters to learn the culture. Look, for example, at this little boy who's imitating what is there in the environment because imitating is his natural inclination. This inclination to imitate exists also in other animals, as we can see in this BBC documentary where David Attenborough talks about this orangutan imitating human behavior. The orangutan imitates sewing, which she saw humans do. I will put a link to this film below. So what is it that literature imitates? It is not imitating any kind of movement or physical behavior. Literature imitates, that is intentionally recreates or creates a way in which we understand the world. And this way is the understanding of reality 
as a story. We humans have the propensity to understand reality as a story. We see in it a multitude of unfolding stories. This understanding is first and foremost connected to the social environment. When we see another person in front of us, we understand that this is a person who has interest to go somewhere, to get something, to, to sit quietly, etc., and that they are agented beings, that is, living beings that feel and want and are able to act upon their own decision or will to act. Each person is a story, and these are the basic elements of a story, a protagonist, a hero of the story, and a plot, uh, the sequence of events that are relevant for the protagonist and upon which this protagonist acts. The events can either be caused by the protagonist or influence the protagonist mentally or physically or move them to take some kind of an action. And these ev events continue and continue and continue until the story comes to an end, a happy one or a sad one. This, this understanding, that is the a story behind the person we perceive, is not something with, with uh, which we are born. It is something that we, as members of human society, have to learn. We learn to understand that other people are agented beings and that they have their own wishes and plans, which are different from ours. This is called theory of mind. Oops. Theory of mind. And sometimes it is called in psychology, empathy. This recognition happens around the age of four. And once we know that other people have their own story, we formulate our own experience of ourselves as a story. We then know how to relate to other people, how to behave in a way that would be beneficial for all. As this is another human propensity, striving for cooperation. As this cooperation is one of the tendencies that helped human race survive throughout evolution. And there are very interesting uh, studies by Michael Tomasello that show uh, this tendency in humans in comparison with others. So recognizing a story in others helps us formulate or rather organize ourselves as storied beings as well. And even, and this is something that we typically see in religions, see the whole existence as a big story. Mythologies and religions tell us that the existence of the world is part of a story. It was created by someone's will and action. This is God in religions and for a purpose. What this purpose is depends on the religion, but it is something in the far future. In this case, we talk about a story that is not personal, but is a social story. A story which the whole society shares. If we remember that the organizing reality as a story helps us cooperate with another person, how much more so can we cooperate if the whole society shares the same story? That is, if hundreds and thousands and millions of people live, live within the same story. For this whole storied reality to work, the story should also be communicated from one person to another. If storied reality is cultural, it has to be learned. That is, parents have to teach it to children, for example. Parents have to explain to their children that there is such a thing as another person, that uh, the, the other person is moved by certain things and uh, what they feel about what is happening to them. The best tool that humans invented for the purpose of communicating stories to each other is language. Language is not absolutely necessary if we want to communicate to one person one person only, one other person only. In such cases, uh, we could maybe simply just point to things or uh, play them out or uh, even just look at other things 
and this would bring the message, but to communicate something unseen to the teller and to the listener, be it something that is not happening here and now or something that is conceptual like justice or some somebody's fears, emotions, we need a more sophisticated tool of communication than, than just pointing and looking and language is such a tool. See, for example, this uh, picture of this crying girl. She looks very sad and we are not sure what happened to her. Perhaps something awful happened in school. But no, the reason she cries is because she just she has just received a kitten as a present. She is actually very happy. So from the look only, we cannot always understand what happens. But language can make things very clear. Hearing the story of this little girl, that is, she came back from school and found this kitten that is given to her as a present and she always wanted to have a kitten, etc. Yeah, so this makes her behavior very clear. But this doesn't always, it, it doesn't only explain her behavior, it also teaches the listener to the story that crying is a possible, if not necessarily the most proper reaction to such an extreme happiness. So we learn another value or cultural behavior through the story. This type of thinking, the type of cognition that sees reality as a story is called mythic cognition from the word mythos story in Greek. Uh, Merlin Donald uh, coined this, uh, this term for this type of cognition. He's a neuroscientist who worked on the evolution of human cognition. So language is the tool that humans have invented to support their understanding of reality as a story by being a tool for communicating complicated information. But, and this is unlike others, it enables them to communicate stories of unseen things, of things that are not here and now. Stories that activate the imagination and make the imagination see things that don't exist. Imaginary, fiction if you want. This possibility is very important for two basic reasons. The first is education, as we mentioned earlier. When you tell stories to children, you expose them to the proper cultural behavior by telling them about behaviors of fictional characters, other people, fictional or non-fictional. In a story, we also find an assessment of the people's behavior and of the events. Is it, a, is it good or bad that this happened in this way? Should we do the same? As well as uh, how to nuance good and bad by relating to a complex situation that happens to a person with whom, toward whom we have this empathy. Stories exemplify to the listener, because we are talking uh, about uh, oral culture at the moment, how to react and how to feel about certain types of events or people. The children thus learn the value and the customs of the culture. This is called socialization. That is the process in which children are directed to acquire the values and customs of the society. Such stories are told within a family or by other trusted adults. The second basic thing which uh, stories support is the creation of a large group cohesion. Groups the size of a country or a nation. By having a national story, a grand story about origin and the fight for establishment, about the beliefs and values, as well as small stories in which the current reality is related to the grand story, group members feel part of the group and feel solidarity even with people that they don't actually know. The grand story is told from childhood in official social institutions, such as schools. And this grand story is also kept up, so to speak, in the media. 
these adult stories are not always called stories. Sometimes they're called history, sometimes news, reality programs, sermons in church. It is, in fact, all over public areas of the society, as they are the story of the society which has to be constantly told and retold in various ways. This phenomena of solidarity with a large size group was termed in academic study imagined community, a community that exists because of the work of the imagination. Storied understanding of reality existed and still exists separately from the invention of language and certainly before writing. Language as a tool, a mental tool for communication is able to crystallize stories in a wonderful way. The idea that language is a tool for communication is discussed at length by the linguist Daniel Everett in his book, Language as a Cultural Tool, for example. But this explanation of what language is, uh, is not accepted by all linguists. Some, thinks, some, some of them think that language is an inherent quality in people and not an invented tool, that it is biological. But regardless of what we think language is, it is certainly a wonderful tool for stories. It is such a good tool for it that we can hardly now think of stories without language. It is used by one person to inform another when they are both present in the same place. But then came the invention of writing. Signs on a flat surface where each sign represents one of the sounds of the language. And when one reads these signs and pronounces them in actuality or in, in imagination, one after the other, one recreates a, a line of words, which is a reconstruction of what was intended to be said by the one who wrote these down. We don't know whether what is written was ever said, perhaps they skipped this stage of speaking, but uh, anyway, it was said in the imagination, or it could have been said. Writing the sounds was not the first option in the invention uh, of writing. In an earlier stage, each, each sign signified not a sound, but an object, a general object or a concept, such as cow, sheep, person, storm, disease, love. This is called pictographic writing. And it was found in Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, and other places. But this was less practical since uh, there are so many concepts and ideas, and it is difficult to express them in uh, pictograms sometimes, while the number of recognized sounds in a language is much smaller once the sounds were conceptualized as separate signs. So the transition into writing the sounds, that is into the alphabetic system, was a jump forward in the evolution of writing and of human culture. But for our purpose, with regard to the issue of stories, the important thing about writing is that it enables a person to know a story, that is read what is communicated, that is told by someone whom they don't see and they don't hear and they possibly also don't know. Yeah, so people that are not in the same place at the same time can communicate. And therefore, in order for the interaction between the teller and the audience to take place properly, a lot of effort has to be put by both the teller and the audience in order for the story to be relevant, uh, plausible, and believed by the listeners. Much work and intention, as well as artistic talent, has to be put into the words that make up the written story. Stories that are put into writing are usually referred to as narratives, and a body of written narratives is called literature. As you can see from this Wikipedia entry, there's also oral literature, which is not written down. It is composed in order to be transmitted orally. 
And the word literature sometimes refers not only to artistically crafted stories for the sake of being literature, but also drama or poetry, which uh, has to be read publicly sometimes. Drama has to be played. Uh, sometimes the word also refers to a wider range of stories, not uh, modern crafted ones such as myth, folk tales. Um, we will not go into this now uh, to what the, the definition of literature is, and we will stick to the intuitive understanding of the term literature as intentionally written stories in order to be read privately, basically. Literature, then, in a society that uses it by reading it, serves a similar purpose as stories in general. It is, after all, a type of a story. It is modeling possible behavior for its readers, as well as creating group affiliation of all those who belong or affiliate themselves with the society depicted in particular literature or the author of a particular literature. A few academic fields are dedicated to the study of literature from uh, various aspects. One of them is a relatively new one from the second half of the 20th century. It is narratology, which, as you can guess, is dedicated to narratives, that is, written, storied words, but later this also expanded into uh, oral discourse. The term narratology was coined by the Bulgarian-French philosopher Zvetan Todorov, Grammaire du Decameron, from 1969. He talked about a science working on universal narrative expressions. This was his vision. It means not looking at the surface of the narrative, but deeper into the universal structure of narratives, into the art of writing a story, into the work of the author, what is it that he does with the language. For example, not to talk about what the protagonist feels in the story, but to question how does the text make us know what the protagonist feels and actually feel it ourselves as if we were interacting with a real person. So it is looking at how the words of a narrative of a narrative are creating a reality in the mind of the reader, and this is sometimes called cognitive narratology. So the basic move of uh, narratology was to differentiate between what we experience from the text as from the text and what is actually written in a text in order to reflect on how the text works. This narratological revolution is influenced by the structuralist revolution from the beginning of the 20th century, which looked first at language from a linguistic perspective. Uh, Ferdinand de Saussure was the, the person who uh, initiated this, and then into culture as a structure. This was done initially by Claude Lévi-Strauss. Culture not being elements that have meaning, but they have a meaning as a system in which meaning arises as a result of interaction between elements. Text world theory on which this course is focused is heavily influenced and indeed is a type of narratological approach. Assignment on the lecture, The Storied Mind. This lecture talks about a storied reality. Give an example of a cultural artifact a thing or a behavior in Dutch culture that is not storied and discuss how clear unclear the meaning of this cultural artifact is. If you're not Dutch, you can give an example from uh, another culture. Submit your answer of around 200 words in the assignment link found below this lecture. The deadline for submission is indicated on the learning platform. Thank you for listening and see you next time.